Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week. We are in the company of Mira Kamdar of the International New York Times, Pierre Aski of French news website Rue 89, 89th Street, uh, Andre Neto of Brazilian daily newspaper O Estado de Sao Paulo, and Julia Wono of Internet Without Borders. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Foreign editor Christopher Dickey joins us from Washington, D.C., uh, we were talking just before the break, Christopher, about uh, Donald Trump's uh, Jekyll and Hyde Act when he uh, visited Mexico on Wednesday and then again uh, repeated his build a wall mantra in an immigration policy speech in Arizona. Uh, a lot of people appalled, but we noticed, Christopher, that uh, the polls suggest he, he is narrowing the gap with Hillary Clinton. What's going on? Well, I think one of the things that we've seen is that uh, Hillary isn't saying very much. She's been sitting back and let, letting uh, Trump put his foot in his mouth or shoot himself in the foot, whatever you would want to say about him. Uh, and that's been fairly successful so far. But I think she's been keeping really too low a profile. And she's got to come back on the scene now. We may then see the polls start to divide again. But, you know, I, I worry about people who say, Trump can't possibly win. It's a done deal. And you hear that a lot now in the States. It's, it's that he doesn't have a prayer. I think he does have a prayer. Uh, and I think that he speaks in a way that a lot of people respond to, even if uh, a lot of what he says is built on lies and uh, innuendos. Uh, it, he says it in a way that a lot of people listen to in this country. And I think that uh, that makes him a dangerous candidate still. And there are even Latinos who say they want to vote for him. Explain that to us. Well, I don't know. I wish they'd explain it to me. I, I don't really understand. I mean, one of the things that does happen when you talk about immigration is that there's always a tendency for people who are already here to want to pull up the ladder behind them and say, OK, we're here, we've made it, uh, but we don't want uh, lots of other people coming in. I think Latinos uh, here in this country, first of all, it's a mixed group. It isn't all Mexicans. It's not all Cubans. It's not all Central Americans or South Americans. There's a lot of different Latinos in this country. Uh, and I think that uh, a lot of the who are here and are making it uh, don't want a lot of extra competition. On the other hand, they don't want a lot of racist persecution, uh, which is, in fact, the subtext uh, for a lot of what uh, Donald Trump is saying. OK, so you said to us uh, Hillary Clinton uh, hasn't put this one away early. Uh, how will it look in the debates? Because we, what we saw on Wednesday was Trump's really at ease, just... Uh, saying whatever he needs to say according to where he's standing. Well, that's exactly right, which makes him, in fact, very difficult to debate. He says whatever comes into his head. You could say that in other debates, somebody, one, one person could look at the other and say you're entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to make up your own facts. But he makes up his own facts all the time, and he gets away with it. Uh, it's, it's a direct outgrowth of talk radio type news in this country, the Rush Limbaugh's, uh, who have basically poisoned the political environment here. And it is precisely what they have done over the years through innuendo, through lies, through fabrications uh, that's made Trump possible. And ironically, what we're hearing a lot of now is the possibility that Trump will start some kind of television or radio network when this is all over if he loses, uh, which you might call uh, Make America Hate Again. Uh, and and uh, he will he will he will be filled filling the airwaves with these anger angry fabrications uh, that tell Americans life is just terrible and uh, and that they should do everything they can to thwart uh, the Democratic Party and uh, the Democratic president if Hillary is elected. Uh, one final question for you, Christopher: Have you ever seen a U.S. presidential election campaign like this one? No, this is by far the most depressing campaign I've ever seen in my lifetime, and my life's been a fairly long one at this point. Uh, you know, I was, I was a little worried when Reagan, the Hollywood actor, was running against Jimmy Carter, this sort of failed malaise-ridden uh, president. That was pretty depressing, but this is just appalling, uh, not only because Trump is an appalling candidate, but because Hillary is quite a weak one. Uh, and if she were up against a strong Republican candidate, a sane Republican candidate, I think it would be a very close race indeed. Christopher Dickey, foreign editor of The Daily Beast, many thanks for joining us from Washington. Mira Kamdar, you, you agree on that point, that this is the most depressing U.S. election in, in, in uh, campaign in 
most depressing, most disturbing, most alarming. I mean, we can use a lot of adverbs. I think, I mean, it, 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 it has revealed a depth of, of, of so many problems in the United States. I mean, um, Christopher Dickey just talked about the poisoning of the American popular mind by talk radio, far-right talk radio. But, you know, you can also put that together with a collapsing public education system. <laughs> you can put that together with uh, the middle class, uh, uh, you know, the pressure on the middle class, uh, high unemployment among certain sectors of the society, deindustrialization. So, and all those things have come together in this kind of a toxic brew that that uh, Trump has been able to whip up using the oldest the oldest uh, you know negative um, evil thing in the United States, which is racism, kind of hearkening back to the original sin of the United States, which was slavery, and we, he's we, been able to whip that up very effectively. Pierre, Pierre Aski, uh, on this set Thursday, we had a debate. There was a member of the far right National Front uh, who was applauding Donald Trump, uh, speaking in. A much more poised and sane fashion, if you will. Uh, what can we expect from the next next French presidential election? Actually, I was going to to say, you know, uh, uh, both Chris and, and Mira have, have been pointing out the fact that we there is something common between the U.S. election, what happened in the U.K. with the Brexit referendum, and what we are seeing developing at the moment, because it's only the beginning of the election campaign in France, is what someone has called the post-truth era, is that you, you're not debating about facts or arguments. And, and as Chris said, you, you make up the facts and then no one cares. And, and we see that today uh, with the inflammatory debate that's growing up about Islam, about mm. ident identity uh, being the, the core uh, issue uh, that, uh, that the French are going to decide upon when, when you have unemployment, when you have uh, you know, uh, uh, so many other issues at stake, and and I think th there is it's very uh, similar in the sense that politicians are using are using scapegoats in in the U.S. It's the Mexicans here, it's the Muslims, and 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 it's a way of uh, raising emotions and not uh, reflections on on the issues. And I think it's very worrying about the state of our democracies, not because we're talking about the U.S. and and and. And obviously, Trump is a good client, uh, as we say in our jargon. Uh, he, he, you know, we laugh every time we see him on the screen, but it's, it's a disease that's contaminated all our democracies. One year ago, this is also a tale of globalization, when you're talking about Mexicans or Central Americans going to the U.S. or here in Europe, to think it was one year ago, the photograph of three-year-old Ilan Kurdi's lifeless body washing up on a Turkish beach, going viral, exposing the horror of the worst refugee crisis since World War II and prompting the German chancellor to act. Germany is a strong country, and that's why we need to tackle this problem. We can do it. Many say that um, what Angela Merkel did was a, a, an impulsive decision that was irresponsible, that uh, Europe just wasn't ready for what followed uh, uh, afterwards. On the one hand, there's the rhetoric, the way you, you, get, you, you get your ideas across, but on the other hand, there, that issue of, of immigration seems to be the issue, whether you're talking about Brexit, the U.S. election, or, or here in Europe. Yeah, I think the question is uh, irresponsible regarding who, regarding uh, people, human rights that are suffering the, uh, at the war in, in Syria regarding the, the uh, German society. I think if we compare the, the, the situation, uh, we have the answer. It's a very complicated time for, for being a, a, a chancellor uh, in, in uh, Germany and the president in France or, or being the president in, in Brazil or in the States. I agree with Pierre, it's, it's a very complicated time for democracy. Uh, and and uh, when uh, the public opinion started to ask questions if we uh, can and if we need to help these people, I think we are asking the wrong question. Mm. Well, why are people who are uh, making the points like, like the one we just heard so poor at convincing others? They are not poor at convincing the others. It's just that they don't have... Public opinion polls in this country are against the arrival of new immigrants. Because politicians have not been able to offer a proper 
and respectful debate on these questions. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, when I see, when we see what's happening in Germany, Germany has been able to, uh, after what happened, the rape cases uh, that happened in, in, Co in Cologne uh, last year, the country could have easy, easily gone on into this, uh, yes, we shouldn't have welcomed these refugees. But today, there are programs to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, employ these immigrants, to train them and employ them, uh, because obviously the country needs this. this, this so uh, Germany prepared, money. but the rest of Europe didn't, is what, is what you're saying. I'm just saying that they offered an, an, an interesting, uh, dignified debate on this issue, which was necessarily not the case elsewhere. And we are seeing uh, this with the jungle of Calais. Uh, and it's only now that, uh, you know, the government decided that these people should be living in decent conditions, which is uh, quite, quite, I mean, I think it's quite a bit late. But uh, yes, there hasn't been a, you know, a debate, respectful debate on these issues. Right, we're, gonna we're gonna switch continents now. The next segment, we're calling it Unlikely Result Predictable Outcome. Goebbels, incumbent president, garnering 95% of the vote in his home province on 99.93% turnout. National rate, by the way, is around 60%. That was the unlikely bit. The predictable outcome is what uh, has tragically followed deadly rioting in the capital, mass arrests, and statements like those of Ali Bongo chastising those who question an election where he won by less than 6,000 votes. Democracy doesn't sit well with self-proclaimed success and groups formed for destruction. Democracy doesn't sit well with an attack on the parliament and the national TV. Now, uh, as for the former colonial power, France, it is appealing for calm, but also for the publication of the vote polling station by polling station. France is very worried about the situation in Gabon. The vote of the Gabonese people must be respected. Contesting the election results must be done by legal means, not through violence. We now ask Gabon's government to show its commitment to transparency by publishing the results bureau by bureau. Now, the, the French government's gone further this Friday, saying that uh, they want the opposition leaders to be able to free as they go. They were holed up in their headquarters uh, uh, in Libreville, in the capital. Julia Wono, those who support Ali Bongo, saying France is meddling and that they're taking sides against the president, uh, it seems as though the French are damned if they do intervene and damned if they stay out of it. Uh, in the case of Gabon, it's uh, quite particular because you have to go back to 2009 to understand. Um, it's funny that today uh, partisans of Ali Bongo are saying that France is meddling in when in 2009, uh, despite very disputable, uh, disputable uh, election uh, of Ali Bongo, uh, the French government you know, congratulate Ali Bungo was am among the first governments to congratulate the, 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 the winner, I mean, alleged winner, uh, despite uh, marred irregularities. Okay, so there, there seems to be some kind of falling out that's happened, but is, is France making the right noises right now? Are they doing the right thing right now? They have a political debt uh, for Gabon, I think. Like Emmanuel Valls said, uh, Ali Bongo was not democratically elected in 2009, and everybody knows it. And so France does have a political responsibility. What is interesting here is that um, despite the orchestrated electoral coup that the, the, the regime in Gabon tried to, 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 uh, you know, to instate, there has been a very strong civil society which ha has helped us witness uh, what was happening because the, the civil society has been organizing since 2009 uh, and today it was able to publish uh, uh, provisional uh, results uh, in real time on, online. It has been able to have observers in polling state in every single polling station of the country, which has, which is very rare for a continent and this part of Africa uh, to be mentioned. And most importantly, all the international observers agreed on the fact that there have been irregularities. And what is even more, um, you know, preoccupying is that EU mission was expelled from one of the polling state. Um, I mean, the centralization of vote station, uh, the one of Libreville. So the, all this 
did cast doubts on the integrity of the results. And today we have debates on the figures. Uh, but yes, I think there is a moral responsibility of the former colonial power, if you want to call it uh, precisely. Uh, but what's interesting is that it's done in a legally, it's, uh, it's done in an, in an interesting way. Instead of going through bilateral agreements, which are very, which were very criticized and were very mm. long kept secrets, now France is calling on the international community before, uh, I mean, to ask whether the international community should pitch in. Pierre Aski? France is sitting between two chairs, as we say in French, uh, in the sense that it's so involved in a very incestuous way in the history of Gabon. You know, uh, it has so much interest at stake there. It's it's controlling the the oil industry. It's got thousands of French residents there. It's got an army base. There's there's a military presence from the French army in Libreville. Uh, 450 men. It's not a lot, but it's it's significant, uh, symbolic, and 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 so. France, uh, uh, we, we just heard the, the foreign minister, he goes as far as he can do uh, to uh, distance himself from a, a, a highly controversial election result, but he's not capable of saying this is a fraud and, and, uh, and we, we ask for this election to be cancelled or, or even to rally Europe to say that because there would be riots against the French as it happened in 2009 yeah, right. when Sarkozy because that's what, uh, what Julie was saying. Nicolas Sarkozy, the previous president, supported Ali Bongo when he was fraudulently elected. So you have to, to take into account the fact that you have half a century or even more of French and Gabonese incestuous relationship. Uh, and, and it goes also to the opposition leader. You know, there's a book that came out 30 years ago that said a very interesting story. Jean Ping, the op opponent to Ali Bongo, was at that time the chief of staff of the father of Omar Bongo, who was the president. And when there was an election in France in 1981, which brought uh, Mitterrand, the social, first socialist president, to power, Jean Ping went to the headquarters of the Socialist Party with a suitcase full of money. And he expected to be kicked out. And the, the first suitcase was accepted, and more suitcases were accepted. And, and Omar Bongo, the, the, the former president, uh, sacked two French corporation ministers 25 years apart. So, I mean, you, you, there's no other country, uh, no other two countries in the world with that kind of relationship. It's a symbiotic so, relationship. It, it's an amazing uh, situation. There's a, there's a, we should write a, a thousand <laughs> pages about that. It's, it's right. incredible. <laughs> Thanks, but no thanks. Earlier this week, the European Commission slapping a record 13.5 billion euro fine on Apple, ordering the maker of the iPhone to pay Ireland for creative bookkeeping that, uh, well, beyond a generous 12.5% corporate tax rate, had Apple in some years paying a 0.005% tax to the nation that's home to its overseas headquarters. Apple is angry. So is Washington. And so is Dublin, which is appealing the ruling. We have these obligations. The point about this, that would be a short-term gain for long-term pain uh, because the people employed in the foreign direct investment companies in Ireland, they pay an enormous amount of personal tax in USC and in income tax. And if they lose their jobs, they won't pay the tax. Is Ireland right? Well, Ireland may be right on that specific point, but does that mean that Apple shouldn't pay? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, Ireland's point is pretty out front. Look, this is a good deal for us because it attracts these industries here and we give them this break and that creates a few jobs for Irish people and it's helped Ireland come out of the financial crisis, no doubt. But uh, on the American side, it's almost just pure hypocrisy because it's the reason that the American government is They see upset. it as Yankee bashing. Here you are targeting no, no. Americans. It's, it's worse than this. It's, 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 it's more venal than that. It's money. That money has, is, is, has been on the books. It's calculated in terms of future U.S. economic performance as money that would one day be repatriated and one day taxed in the United States. So here the EU is going to take the tax money that the U.S. was <laughs> counting on? No way. <laughs> no way. And that's why they're very upset. But at the same time, Congress has failed to reform the U.S. corporate tax code and has allowed this situation to continue. So, All right. Even if you've never heard his name, you may have seen his 1953 picture of a workman on the Eiffel Tower, French photojournalist Marc Ribou, passing away this week at the age of 93, a stalwart of the Magnum Photo Agency in the heyday of photojournalism. Ribou's assignments took him to the four corners of the globe, from Cuba to Vietnam, 
to this 1967 flower power protest pick against the Vietnam War. Um, <clears throat> In uh, 1957, Marc Ribou was invited to China by Mao's regime. Pierre Husky, you're a former correspondent there. His memorable photos include um, this one here of uh, a woman eating in a steel mill in uh, Liaoning uh, mm. province. W what does that picture tell you? He was uh, interested not so much in the leaders, but in the people. And, and, and you know, I met Marc Ribou in, in China uh, much later when I was a correspondent and and we walked in in a small town where there was a photo festival and he was always with his Leica camera and and looking for the the, the right picture uh, and and this is the way he was working he was not uh, going to photo ops or to uh, to look for events he was really looking for the the image that uh, would say a lot about the country about the the time in history and and that's what his photos from the 50s in China just show. And, and I have to say that he was a rock star in China. I mean, in this small town where there was this photo festival, there were hundreds of photographers, amateur and professionals from all over China. He couldn't walk two meters with, without being stopped. People wanted to be photographed with him, wanting an autograph, wanting to exchange on photography. He was so well known in, in that circle of people uh, who were interested in photography, that it was incredible that a, a foreigner uh, could reach that, that kind of fame in, in, in that country. It, it's about uh, Machibu or it's about an era where that has gone now, where the photojournalists could have a name that's known worldwide? It, it, it's both. Obviously, he represents, the, the, as many people have said, the golden era of photojournalism, which is uh, definitely dead by now. But it's also his personality. And I think his, his personal style, the way he approached photography and, and his subjects uh, uh, was really very personal and very uh, uh, unique. And, and that made him uh, uh, a, a particular name in, in photojournalism. There are many great, great names in that generation of photographers, but he had a, a particular uh, spot. All right, we're going to leave it there. Pierre Aski, I want to thank you. I want to thank as well Julia Wono, Mira Kamdar, Andre Neto. Stay with us, though. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. So on the French news websites today, the big story was the announcement that uh, the Calais jungle camp is to be dismantled. Uh, so lots of different angles on that particular story. Uh, it's to be dismantled, uh, well, little by little, according to uh, the interior minister. But that has uh, given rise to complaints by the mayor of Calais, who has said he had promised her that it would all be taken down in one foul swoop. Uh, you've had uh, Alain Juppé, amongst others, uh, going uh, to Calais and uh, the Huffington Post is saying here that it is a sort of a, an obligatory stop for any candidate who is, uh, um, for, uh, who is trying to get the nod for the political, uh, for the election next year on the political right. You have to, it's, it's such a, I suppose, a flashpoint issue uh, that they all, all have to be seen to be there, uh, aware of the issues and aware of uh, the broader issues that it represents. Um, for the local Local.fr, they are quoting uh, representatives from Médecins Sans Frontières and other such organisations and NGOs saying that this is utterly pointless unless the broad, broader solutions are found, that uh, redistributing uh, the, the uh, inhabitants of uh, the jungle camp to various different locations around France has already been tried and a lot of the time they'll just end up going right back to Calais because of course they want, a lot of them want to go to the UK. So uh, that's uh, getting quite a lot of coverage uh, in France today and I think uh, it, it, the fact that this comes one year after uh, yeah. the death of Aylan Kurdi, uh, the fact that the issue of uh, refugees and migrants is being uh, in somewhat con conflated with a broader question uh, or with other security issues and terrorism is demonstrated quite well by an interview given this morning by Nadine Marano. She mentioned 
Calais and uh, security issues sort of in one this breath. right-wing politician. That's right. She spoke about, she said, uh, uh, Isla, is, or is radical Islamists covering them uh, are using the weaknesses of, of our law in order, in, in order to have invade us, and you can see that with what is happening in Calais. So I suppose uh, that the fact that an election is coming up next year and the fact that security issues are being conflated with refugee issues or migrant issues is certainly means that uh, uh, the public sympathy, I guess, for the inhabitants of Cali is going down. Andre Neto of Cali, a town that used to vote socialist, is now gone to the right. There's a protest planned on Monday of the locals who are fed up to say the situation's out of control. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you when you say that uh, all the solutions uh, that have been tried by uh, the socialist government already uh, tried and it's not working. So we have to, to, to try something new. And uh, I think that even if we have a riot in this region of France, we cannot be uh, punished because this is about to happen. Uh, it's impossible to keep 10,000 people living in those circumstances and uh, expecting that uh, everything will be fine. Is it done on purpose, to sort of as a poster for, some say it's to, it's to dissuade people from coming? <laughs> yeah, I think we, we, we can agree with this. Uh, I'm not sure if we can uh, find a solution in the terms we are discussing for Calais. Right now, I think the British government has uh, to have a word on this. Frankly, uh, I don't see any uh, issue, any, any kind of uh, way to resolve this problem without an agreement between the two countries. So between, between France and the UK. Yeah. All right, we'll leave it there. I want to thank you, James Creedon. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in The World This Week.